Well, good afternoon, church. If the songs are any indication, we are going to be talking today about the Lord's Table or the Lord's Supper. And uh, there's much for us to discover today from this text that we're about to open up to. Uh, and so I want to uh, just get right on with it uh, to uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And as you know, we've been continuing in Acts chapter 2 as of late, uh, but uh, we find ourselves uh, staying here for just a little bit longer as we uh, really uh, seek to discern all that the Lord has for us uh, from this verse. And so again, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 And I'll read the text, and then we will go to the Lord in prayer. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Our Father, we come to you now as we get this opportunity to open up to your word and and to be able to be fed um, and nourished uh, by the glorious truth that comes uh, from your life-giving word to your Son, Jesus Christ. And we just come now as... as, um, as your children, Lord, seeking to, to know more of you, to, more, to, know more, to know more of your will, to know more of your ways, in order that we would be able to remain obedient to you and to bring glory and honor and praise to your most glorious name. Lord, you alone are worthy. And may we always be reminded of that as we come together as in fellowship and open up your word. And so, Lord, we're just, Lord I just pray this, um, this time of fellowship now as we, as we uh, partake of your word together, uh, that it would be a joyful time and that you would enrich us uh, by your spirit. It's through Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are continuing in our study from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And as you have been with us, you know that uh, we have uh, looked at this text now, being this being the third week uh, that we have looked at just this single verse uh, here in the book of Acts. And the reason being is because this verse encompasses the entire subject of the church, which is what all of us are uh, have been united to uh, through our faith in Jesus Christ. And so this verse is of vital importance to our spiritual lives. Uh, this verse is, is consisting of what the early church would do. Uh, what did their worship consist of? How, do they, how long did they do it for? When did they do it? Where did they do it? In what way did they do it? All of these things, these questions that we have about why we do what we do can come to our knowledge as we open up to the pages of Scripture and see how God's people, who were filled with the Spirit on that day of Pentecost, uh, reacted uh, reacted to the filling of the Spirit and the unity that was brought about uh, through their being baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. You know, why is it that we do what we do? And, and not only that, but how are we to be united as we go? All of these things, all of these things, these, these questions that we have can be answered as we look to this verse in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Now for us today, as we, as we look to the text, you'll remember last week we looked at the, uh, uh, the church fellowship and how they were devoting themselves to the fellowship. And I mentioned last week that one of the activities of our fellowship uh, is in the breaking of bread. And, um, and if you remember, that that is the third point in our text here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And so we're going to spend an awful lot of time today looking at what does this phrase, the breaking of bread, entail? What does it mean that we would devote ourselves to the breaking of the bread? But before we do this, I just want us to consider something for a moment, to consider the unity that we have with one another. If you think about us as a church here at the First Baptist Church of Hollywood, we come together from all different areas of life, different economic backgrounds, different political backgrounds, different uh, uh, backgrounds in, in, uh, in how we were raised and in, in whether we were raised in a Christian home or a non-Christian home. We come together with all of these differences and yet we are called to remain united. Uh, One of these differences that we have is that uh, there are some of us here today who are uh, lifers in the faith, you could say. We've been uh, following the the Lord Jesus Christ for a number of years. We are mature in the faith. Uh, We have been devoting ourselves to the Lord uh, for a, uh, a very long amount of time. But then you have others within the church who are babes in the faith, maybe having only been uh, given their lives to Christ within the past few years or few months or few days. Uh, Whatever the case might be, we have our differences in that uh, all of us are on a different journey in the life of faith with Jesus Christ. On top of all of this, we face our own difficult trials and tribulations. We face uh, the difficulties of persecution, maybe persecution from our boss who says, why are you following the Lord so often? Why are you devoting yourselves to the church and to the Lord? Why don't you devote more time to what you have here in your job? Or maybe with our family members who say, why are you following the Lord? Why are you wasting your life with that worthless endeavor? And, And that persecution we face 
is not so much what we face here in the church since we are like-minded together, but, but outside of the church. We have these difficulties that we face every single day, every single week, uh, whether it be from our family members, our friends, our loved ones, our co-workers, our boss, or just people who we do not even know. But all of us, not only do we have those persecutions in that way, but all of us have the battles of the flesh that every single one of us as followers of Christ go through. Every single one of us are in this spiritual battle, a warfare like the Apostle Paul calls it, in which we are tempted to give in to the fleshly desires of the world that we so often crave in our fallen nature. This desire to to give in to this sin, this desire to, to not follow Christ completely, this desire to just give in for that little moment and then I'll come back to the faith and and follow the Lord, devoting myself to Him. All of these things are happening in our lives, and, and, and this is just the Christian life. The Christian life is a battle, and it is not only participated in when we come to the church, but it encompasses every single aspect of our lives. And so this 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 very truth can cause for us as a fellowship to become uh, disunited in a way in which we are not able to draw near to the Lord together in the way in which we are called to do from the scriptures. Now, as we go into this life of faith that all of us have entered into, those of us being followers of Jesus Christ, we all enter into the life of faith as a race. As the author of Hebrews says, let us run the race with endurance as, as we uh, follow after the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus Christ. And many of us are on different uh, uh, laps of our journey, if we use the running metaphor. Some of us are further along in the race than others. Some of us are, are kind of falling behind, still weary in the faith. Other of us, others of us are on fire for the Lord. We've got that runner's kick that we so often wish to have as a runner, and we're just able to run with endurance, continuing onward uh, in the race of faith that we have been called into by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we go throughout these things, as I've mentioned, there are going to be difficulties that come along in our lives. There are going to be difficulties that have the tendency to to pull us away from what God is calling us to devote ourselves to. Namely, that we would be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now, what are we to do about these things? Is there a way in which we can avoid these difficulties that we face? Is there a way that we can just say, well, I, I'm tired of dealing with this persecution, and so well, let me look to the Bible to see if there's a way in which uh, I can kind of escape this persecution for the day. Uh, you know, the only way that we can escape persecution is to compromise the message that we have been given, since the world hates the message that we have. And so the truthfulness of our lives, of the truthful reality of our lives, is that there is no escaping the persecution. But that does not mean we have to go throughout the persecution alone, but rather we have been given through the, uh, the, through the power of the Holy Spirit a unity with the people here in this world who are just like us, who are followers of Jesus Christ, devoting ourselves to Jesus Christ, and when we come together, we gain that spiritual nourishment, that, that, that strength that we need in order to persevere through this life of faith that we have been called to. Now, as we have in the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus tells us, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have this this promise from Jesus Christ that not only do we have the church with us, but we also have Jesus Christ with us always to the end of the age. And this provides us with a great deal of comfort, this personal relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, knowing that, as it says in the book of Hebrews, he will never leave us nor forsake us. He has promised us that, and we can hold him to his word because we know that he who is promised is faithful. And so as we have been, been brought into this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we then are, by the power of Christ, Christ, as he is seated on his throne, pours out the Spirit into a believer, and the believer then is not only united to Christ, but is also united with united uh, to the body of Jesus Christ. And this is what we have been focusing on as we have looked at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that we are not merely in our own, um, uh, not merely are we only to focus on our personal relationship with Christ, but we also are to grow in our uh, community with Christ, the fellowship of Christ in which we are sharing with one another, in which we are spending time with one another in order that we would be edified and God would receive the glory and the honor praise 
that he is due. We are called to this. We are called to this, this fellowship that Christ has brought us into. And if we neglect the fellowship, well, we neglect a very, uh, the very privilege that Christ brought us into in uniting us to a people who are like-minded in the faith with us. As we think about the trials that we face in our lives, and, and you know, we, we have all of these Christians who will say, well, I just have my own personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I'm good to go with that. Well, we, we think about those individuals, but what if they face persecution? What if they feel all alone in this, this, this lonely state, which they, they find themselves being all alone with the temptations of the world, just gripping away at them, dragging them by their flesh, and just trying to bring them into the world to the lustful desires of the flesh. What are they to do in that situation? They say, well, I have a personal relationship with the Lord, but when we are in our flesh, we, 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 we don't lose that relationship with the Lord, but we lose sight of the relationship we have with Him, and we are tempted, not only tempted, but we give in to that sin of the flesh as we live this, this lonely, individual, individualistic a, a, a way of life. But you see, when we have a fellowship of believers around us, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, we have them to come alongside us. When we face these trials and when we feel alone, in order that Satan cannot uh, uh, get his little uh, uh, wedges, little place in our lives and, and lead us into that temptation, we are brothers and sisters in the Lord who are able to, to, to comfort one another and to care for one another. I often think about this, this illustration that I've, I was thinking about a few years ago and how it works for us as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And, and how when we are tempted by Satan, it is as if he is, you know, as, as we are tempted by Satan, we are, we are brought to our knees uh, with, just, uh, with just trying to resist the temptation that he is giving to us. And it is as if that Satan is standing over us, we're laying down, and Satan is standing over us with his foot upon our neck and we have no escape. But then we have our brother or sister in the Lord come alongside us, rip Satan from our clutches, and then we are free to go and, and follow the Lord in a faithful way in which he is called for us to live. It is like that in the brotherhood and the sisterhood of the faith that we have. Certainly, we are to go to Jesus Christ and find our strength in Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ has also made a way in which we can draw near to him, and that is through his body, through our brothers and sisters in the Lord who will help us in our times of trials. You see, I believe this idea that I have mentioned, this individualistic idea, is one of the greatest dangers that is uh, coming into the 21st century church. This idea that is so prominent in our society, which says, I can do all things by myself. I don't need anyone's help. I don't need to be with you or you or you. I'm going to do it on my own way, on my terms, and that is what is going to happen. And you have these individuals who are in the world running in the rat race and uh, you have all of these people running and if someone trips they get stepped over or stomped upon and left behind and they find themselves lonely and afraid with no place to go being an outcast in the world. This same thing can happen within the life of the church. As everyone has their own individualistic ideas within the church of how we should be run, how we should be governed, what we should be doing, you have these other individuals who are uh, trying to keep up with the pace that these people have set, and they fall down. And instead of us as brothers and sisters in the Lord uh, caring for them in our own individualism, we don't even see them as we step over them and run beyond them when we should give them that helping hand to lift them up to bring them along in the faith with us as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Now, as we have this as a stumbling block for us within our church, this idea of individualism, we must be cautious to guard ourselves against this in order that we would be able to run alongside one another in the race of faith that Christ has called us to run. And you say, well, how do we do this? How do we continue to run alongside one another in the race of faith that Christ has called us to? But we do so by uniting with a local fellowship, which we call the church, and which scripture calls the church. You see, if we as Christians are going to be able to stand against the temptations of this world, the persecutions that we face, and the loneliness that we often experience in our lives, we must be united to a local fellowship. We must remain faithfully committed to Christ and, and, and being a part of his body, and that being at a local assembly, uh, wherever it is that you find yourself to be. And all of us here today in Hollywood, you are to unite with a local fellowship in order that you can continue to run alongside your brothers and sisters in the Lord in this life of faith that we have been called to. 
Now, this is what we see happening here in the book of Acts. We have all of these new believers along with the 120 believers uh, who uh, had followed Jesus Christ throughout his earthly ministry. And so you have some of those within the church who would be considered lifers in a sense. They've, they've been following the Lord for three years. They're spiritually mature in the faith. And now they have these 3,000 people coming along uh, into the faith with them, uniting themselves to the fellowship by the power of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, how, how is this going to work? you got uh, 3,120 people coming together. You have those who are babes in the faith and those who are mature in the faith. How are they going to function? How is it that they are going to be able, when trials come or when difficulties come or when arguments come or when differences come about, how are they going to be able to remain united in the call that God has given to them to be witnesses for Christ in the world. You see, you see, how is this to be done? Is, is this, this some sort of, we have these um, uh, traditions, as Pastor Richard was preaching on this morning, that, that really equip us to be able to uh, maintain this spiritual unity that we have through Jesus Christ? Is it these uh, organizations that we bring up or these uh, ideas or these tasks that we do in order that we would be able to, to, be able to have this, this unity that these individuals had here in the early church? Is that what we do? Or do we look to the truth from the Word of God to see how God's people have always done it as they have been led by the Spirit to remain united in the faith? Sure, there are going to be problems that come. There will be disagreements that, that, that will come about. But in the unity that we have with one another, we will be able to work past those differences and continue to press forward through Jesus Christ. And so we have this, we have this today for us as the church to be strengthened by what we see happening here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And as we saw a few weeks ago, we saw that the most important thing to the spiritual health of a church is a devotion to the Word of God. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That is the foundation in which we stand upon. Otherwise, there is not going to be any unity going to be chaotic. People are going to do whatever they want. There'll be one person over there, another person over there, another person over there, all saying different things, and it's just going to be chaotic. That does not mean that we cannot have differences in our understanding of certain doctrines, but it does mean that we must remain united and submissive to the doctrines of the church if we are to remain united as a body of believers. And then you have, as we saw last week, that they devoted themselves to the fellowship. And as we saw, fellowship, the word koinonia, is a common sharing among all. And within the context of the church, it is not only just this common sharing among all, but it describes a deep and vital sharing that we as Christians have with both God and other believers. And it covers all aspects of our lives, from the beginning to the end, in the middle, and all the way in between. We are united. We are specially united with one another as the body of Jesus Christ. And as we do this, as we are fellowshipping with one another, it is paramount to our spiritual growth. And so we ought to be devoting ourselves to it. And this is where we find ourselves now this week in verse 42. To the breaking of bread. To the breaking of bread, which is an extenuation of our fellowship. The breaking of bread is this phrase that we see here in verse 42 that is that has often been disputed and there's all sorts of interpretations as to what it is. But at, at its core, the breaking of bread that we partake of as brothers and sisters in the Lord is to be emphasized when we come together for the Lord's table or the Lord's supper or the communion that we take of here at the First Baptist Church every first Sunday of the month. Now, the breaking of bread can mean simply a fellowship meal with one another. We, we would come together over a meal like we have potlucks here. That is a way in which you can describe the breaking of bread. But in the context that we have here, given that these other three examples are spiritual examples, we know that it is not merely the breaking of bread and them eating together that is occurring, but there is a spiritual aspect to this, the spiritual aspect being the Lord's table. So what they would do is this. They would come together at someone's house for a meal, since, as many of you probably know, they didn't have a church building. And this day, at the day of Pentecost, they were still having to go into the temple, which was, still, which was run by the Jews, those that hated Christ, that crucified Christ. And so they didn't really have a building uh, to participate in the fellowship at. And so many of them had these house churches in which they would come together for a common meal, a, a common meal or what we also know of as being a love feast, as it says in the book of Jude. They would come together for this meal. They would have this meal together. They would all partake of the food. And then upon the completion of that meal, they would then take a loaf of bread that 
excuse me, the individual who was uh, leading that fellowship time would take that loaf of bread, a single loaf, and they would break apart piece by piece and pass it out to the brothers and sisters in the Lord who were there. And then they would fill up a cup with wine, uh, probably diluted wine, uh, depending on the situation that they were in, but they would take wine and they would pour that into a cup and then all of them would share that cup together. And so we say, is this merely them just taking of the, the cup and, um, and also the bread? Are they just kind of having a, kind of a nightcap to their meal? Or is there a greater deal of significance to this task that they have called themselves to? But we must, we must realize this. It is not merely just this, this insignificant task, as we all know, as being followers of Jesus Christ. But rather, what they are doing at the end of these, these common meals with the breaking of bread is participating in the Lord's table. They are participating in the, the, un, the unity that Christ has brought them into as brothers and sisters in the Lord as they partake of that one bread, one loaf of bread, and that one cup. It is significant to show the unity that they have with one another. You say to us, well, well, why is it that they were doing this? Why did they do this? As I've said, it is, to, it is to show the unity that they have with one another, but it goes even deeper than this. There is a greater significance than even the unity that we have with one another as we partake of the bread and the cup. And the great significance that comes from it is the fact in which Christ has called us to do it. But Christ has not merely just called us to have a meal together. He has called for us to have a meal together in which we would remember his sacrifice for us on the cross at Calvary. His blood that was shed and his body that was broken for us. And so as we come to this this text here, looking at what it means to devote ourselves to the Lord's table, I want us to examine ourselves as to whether or not it is that we are doing this. And I don't mean just going through the motions, devoting ourselves to it, saying, well, I'm here today, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I mean, are we devoting ourselves to it in the way in which we recognize the significance of it? Are we devoting ourselves to it to remain obedient to our Lord? Or are we just viewing this Lord's table as just simply a, a, a task in which we must continue forward in? As Pastor Richard said, you know, we have these traditions that bring up, that are brought up in the church, and and uh, the fact that we take of the communion so often would lead people to believe that it is merely a tradition. But communion is not a tradition. Communion is something in which is an act of worship unto God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And so we must never, never think of it in that way. We must always think of it as a task of worship for us, and in the way in which we will be able to draw near to our great God. Now, in order for us to examine ourselves as to whether or not we are devoting ourselves to the Lord's table, I have three, three things that we are going to look at concerning the breaking of bread or the Lord's table, as I have been calling it. And the outline is the same in which we had last week when we looked at the fellowship, the outline being first, the nature of the Lord's table, secondly, the expression of the Lord's table, and finally, the purpose of the Lord's table. And again, just like last week, with the nature of the Lord's table, what we are asking is, How did the Lord's table come about? What brought it into its existence? Now, in the Gospels and also in the book of 1 Corinthians, we have a retelling of what occurred on the night when the Lord instituted the Lord's table or the Lord's supper. Whatever way you want to call it, it it is all meaning the same things. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, in the book of Luke, chapter 22, in the book of Mark, chapter, uh, chapter 14, and also in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have this example that was given to us. Not only this example, but this, this ordinance that was given to us by Christ in which we are to devote, our, to devote ourselves to it in remembrance of what he has done. And so to just refresh our minds on it, I know many of us are familiar with it, but let's turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 23. And I just want to read this, this, this time of institution of the Lord's Supper that, that Jesus brought about. Luke chapter 22, verse 14 says this. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. 
For the Son of Man goes as it, as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them could be who was going to do this. And so here we see in the book of Luke, likewise in the other two Gospels in the book of 1 Corinthians, the Lord instituting the table, instituting what we as believers continue in doing here some 2,000 years after the Lord had instituted. But it is not merely just a meal that Christ is calling his apostles and all of his followers after his apostles to devote themselves to, but rather it is a time of, of unique sharing, not only with Christ, but also with our brothers and sisters in the Lord that the Lord's table is significant by. It is not merely just this, this little tradition that we do or this little thing that we do at the end of the service, but rather there is a great deal of significance behind the elements that we partake of when we eat of the bread and the cup. But what is this, this significance? What is the significance behind it? Well, as he says here in uh, chapter 22, uh, verse uh, 14, he says, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way in which we have the cup, which is poured out for them, is the new covenant in his blood. You see, the, the Lord's table is not merely some... Uh, just just some act that we partake of, but rather rather there is a great deal of spiritual growth that comes every time we partake of the Lord's table. The Lord called for us to come to the table in order that we would remember the sacrifice that he paid on the cross in order that we would be able to have justification for our sins, that we would be able to be united to God. And so it is a unique sharing that we ha that happens when we come to the Lord's table in fellowship with brothers and sisters in the Lord. The Lord's table pictures the gospel. It pictures the gospel which tells us that we have been set free from our sins through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only does it picture the gospel, but it reminds us of the fact of what Christ has done for you and I. In order that by the difficulties in life, by the persecutions that we might face, that we will never lose sight of the fact that we have eternity promised for us in Jesus Christ. Every time we come to the table, that that is that in which we should be at the forefront of our mind when we devote ourselves to Jesus Christ. Now, in a way, this table, the Lord's table, uh, carries a significance that goes back to the Old Testament with the Passover meal. It is that time in which the Israelites would come together for a feast day, the feast of the Passover. And on this day, they would remember the deliverance that God had brought about from the Egyptians, from the slavery that they were in uh, for the 400 years before Moses uh, was called by God and led the people out of Israel. The Passover meal was, was established as the eternal uh, fellowship meal that they would come together and they would would partake of this meal in order to remember that God is their deliverer. But you see, in this Passover meal, there was never this, this true rejoicing. Because even within this Passover meal, they were reminded of the fact that they, still not yet, they had still not yet been delivered from their sins. God had delivered them from slavery, but the slavery that they were all under was the slavery of sin in which they were constantly constantly dealing with because as we know as we looked in the book of hebrews they were constantly having to offer sacrifices and in these sacrifices and in these meals that they would partake of they really only amounted to a reminder of the sins that they had committed that they were still looking forward to the time in which god would bring about the new covenant that he had promised where the total forgiveness of sins will be brought about by the shedding of the Savior's blood. They still had to look forward to the day when salvation would come. And so even within this Passover meal, though it was a time of rejoicing for them, it was not a complete rejoicing because they still they still were waiting that, that, that wonderful day when the Messiah would come and he would provide the sacrifice for the people's sins. You see, this is why it says, in, in, uh, why Jesus says in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, that the cup that we partake of is the new covenant in his blood. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sins, it enacted, it brought about the new covenant that was promised back in the book of Jeremiah. You see, in the old covenant, when the Mosaic covenant was brought about, it was brought about or ratified by the shedding of blood. There was always the shedding of blood to, to ratify a covenant. And the same is true for the new covenant. In order for the new covenant, which we read of in Jeremiah chapter 31, to be brought about, it had to have bloodshed. There had to be bloodshed in order that that would be brought about. And that is what happened when Christ went to the cross for our sins. When Christ went to the cross and offered himself up as the perfect, spotless Lamb of God 
He, He, and He alone brought about salvation for our sins. And so now as we come to the Lord's table, which is a, uh, which the uh, Passover meal merely pictured, we can look back, not at merely salvation from slavery, but we can look back at our salvation from sin. We can look back and see God's redemptive work, God's once and for all redemptive plan coming to pass in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, when the Jews today look back to the Passover, they jump completely over the sacrifice for sins that Jesus brought about, and they still look back to that time of, 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 of slavery that they were brought out of, missing the fact that God has not only brought them out of the bondage in, in Egypt, but he has brought them out of bondage of their sins if they would only come to his son, Jesus Christ, through faith. It is such a sad thing that the Jews, God's chosen people, have missed it. They have looked all the way back, too far back. They need, they need to come to that day when Christ went to Calvary to save God's people from their sins and, and cry out to God in faith and repentance knowing that Jesus can provide them what the new covenant had promised to them. You see, we must never forget this when we approach the Lord's table. That the Lord's table is a significant time of fellowship, not only within ourselves, with the body of Christ, but also with our Savior. As we remember, as we remember the sacrifice that He paid for you and I. You see, if we fail to do this, if we fail to recognize the great price that was paid in order that we could partake of the table, the purpose becomes absolutely meaningless. And so then, the nature of the Lord's table was brought about by Christ. He instituted it. He makes it significant. It points to Him. And this brings us to the second point. How do we express ourselves at the Lord's table? What happens when we come to the Lord's table? Now, there are a number of, of discussions that can be had about this. That being, what are the elements to consist of? Uh, who is able to pass out the elements? Who is able to put together the elements? All of these questions can come about uh, when we come to the Lord's table. But I'm not interested in us considering those things for today. I have two things that we must understand concerning the expression of the Lord's table in order in which the purpose can become an even greater significance in our lives. Now, the two things that I want us to discuss is this. What actually is happening when we take of the communion? And secondly, what is a way in which communion can become distorted? How can we distort the Lord's table? And so the first thing I want us to see is what is actually happening when we take communion. You see, this is the most important thing for us to have the purpose uh, come to life when we come to the Lord's table. What is actually happening when we eat of the bread and when we drink of the cup? What, what is actually taking place in this time? And the reason that I think that we must uh, consider this is because there are four major thoughts that come about from an individual partaking of the Lord's table. And there, there's, there's four views. You have the Roman Catholic view, you have the Lutheran view, you have the Reformed view, and then you have the, the view that takes after uh, Earl Rich Zwingli, from, if I'm pronouncing his name right. And so we must understand what is actually happening when we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup. The first view comes from the Roman Catholic Church. And if you're familiar with it in, in any way, it's the doctrine of transubstantiation. And what the Roman Catholic Church believes is this. You have the bread and you have the cup, the wine in the cup. And in its initial state, it is merely that. It is just a piece of bread and it is just uh, the, the wine or the grape juice, whichever they choose to use. But when an ordained priest prays over it, consecrates them, it literally becomes the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. The bread that they are eating is actually become, has actually become, with a metaphysical change, the body of Jesus Christ. They are actually eating Jesus' body, and the, the, the wine that they are drinking of actually becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a view that they have held uh, uh, since, um, uh, since you, can, you can look back all the way to the inception of their, of their doctrine of this. This has been held and it has been continually held throughout uh, uh, centuries as, these, as the Roman Catholic Church continues to pass out communion at every Mass that they have. It is a, a, a thing in which they hold a very true, they, they, they believe it is the true Word of God. They believe that this is what all Christians should believe, but is this actually what is happening? I would say that it is absolutely not 
what is happening. There is no way in which that the blood of Jesus Christ and the bread of Jesus Christ, in, in which um, the Catholics believe it to be, is actually the case. Because they are misinterpreting the word of God. They take the term that this is my body and this is my blood, or that you must eat of my flesh and you must uh, drink of my blood in order to have uh, the salvation. They take that to be in a literal sense, when in reality, if you understand the context, Jesus is not talking in a literal sense here. He's talking in a metaphorical sense. But you see, as, these, as the Catholic Church comes together uh, to take of both the bread and the cup, not only are they saying that it actually becomes Jesus' body and his blood, but they take it even a step further where they say there is salvation benefits that come from taking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That when you come to the altar and the priest gives you the bread and gives you the cup, you are having your sins forgiven by taking that. There is a continual offering happening every time you drink of the, the cup and you take of the bread. Every time you do it, you have your sins forgiven and you can and kind of have that right place with God. But you've got to keep going to it because your sins are not completely forgiven because you just have to keep going and taking more of the cup and more of the bread uh, and so on and so forth. And it just continues continues to be this, 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 this terrible, this terrible distortion of the word of God, which preaches a salvation that is by works. You see, when the Catholic Church says that the, that the bread becomes Christ's body and, his, and, the, and the wine becomes his blood, they are saying that Jesus is being sacrificed again through that Lord's table, through the Eucharist, as they call it. They say Jesus is actually being sacrificed again. It is as if he is back up on the cross and they are pouring his blood out from the cross and they are breaking his body from the cross and they are partaking of the sacrifice that he is giving for them. That is absolutely contrary to the scriptures and the word of God. Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all. It was not a continuous sacrifice that he had to do day in and day out. It was a once and for all sacrifice by in which Christ was able to bring about the forgiveness of sins for all who would call on him. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 through 28 says this so clearly, and yet the, the Roman Catholic Church has this in their scriptures, but they completely avoid it. They, they just avoid it, and they leave these people in this, in this state of control, this state of tradition that they have brought about, which does not bring about forgiveness of sins, and leave these people destitute of any spiritual growth. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 says this, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is why a true follower of Jesus Christ should never, should never take of the Catholic Mass. You should never join them in a Lord's table because it is a distortion of the gospel. It is a distortion of the once and for all sacrifice that Christ has done and paid for on Calvary some 2,000 years ago. We must not participate in the Lord's table that they participate in because it distorts the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There are, there are three other views in which the Lord's table is viewed, and, and none of these have the idea of bringing about salvation benefits. And so there are you have the Lutheran Church who views one way, you have the Reformed Church who views another way, and then you have uh, the individuals who take the view of Zwingli who view it in another way. And in all of these ways, these individuals who have, have come up with these ideas and as they have interpreted the Scriptures, none of them none of them think that there is any salvation benefits coming from the Lord's table, but the differences that are in these uh, come about in which the intimate relationship that we have with Christ uh, when we take of these elements. Where, wh what is Christ's presence within the elements that we are partaking of? There is a difference, a major difference between these three denominational groups. And I want us to just think about them in order that we can settle in our own minds what we believe is happening when we are taking of the bread and also of the cup. The, the first view that you have is the Lutheran view, a view that's called consubstantiation, or the real presence. This is a view that was brought about by Martin Luther. As he uh, 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 broke apart from the Catholic Church, he kept some of the traditions of the Catholic Church, 
But he changed communion just a little bit in which he said that the presence of Christ is still within the elements. It just no longer has, or it does not have any salvation benefits, nor does the body and the bread of Christ, uh, body and the blood of Christ actually become the, uh, the elements. The, the, the bread does not become his body, and the wine does not become his body. But Christ is still spiritually present, not spiritually present, still actively present there, in, above, behind, and between the bread. And so when you are eating of the bread at a Lutheran church and drinking of the cup, Christ's body is right there with the elements that you are taking up. But where I think that Luther has gone wrong with this is the fact that it is not, it is not uh, a literal translation that we are to take any time we read of the, uh, communion, uh, the communion passages in Scripture. Luther was very, very firm on the fact that this is my body and this is my blood was to be taken literally. But again, as I've mentioned with the Catholic view, there is nothing in Scripture that should lead us to believe that Christ is literally talking about his own body and his own blood. Because as they were participating at the meal... As the, at the institution of the Lord's Supper, Christ was not pulling a piece of his body off, nor was he uh, cutting his arm so that blood would be able to pour into the cup. It was a symbolic remembrance of what Christ was going to do on the cross that was at stake. And so then you also have this Reformed view, which takes it a little bit further. They have uh, uh, distanced themselves from the Lutheran view in that they don't believe that any part of Christ is physically there, that, he, that the human body of Christ or the human blood of Christ is physically present. But Christ is present in a spiritual way. The bread and the blood are not Christ's. There is uh, Christ's uh, actual body and his, and his blood are not around it at all, but in a spiritual way you are taking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And they say that it seals the love of Christ to believers, giving them the assurance that all the promises of the covenant and the riches of the gospel are theirs by a divine donation. But even in this they say that the, the effect of it depends largely on the faith of that individual, and so you have this this view in which um, the view in which says that there is a spiritual presence of Christ there. He is there in spirit, and there is a, a, a grace that is able to be poured out into your life, where you are affirmed in the covenant, where you have this assurance of your salvation, and you can move forward knowing that you are Christ's in Christ's alone. And then you have this final view, the, the, the view of, of uh, Ulrich Zwingli, the one in which we hold to here at the First Baptist Church of Hollywood, which I believe best represents the biblical truth in this area. And that is that the bread and the cup represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a representation of the body of Christ which was broken for us and the blood of Christ which was shed on the cross. Christ, we do not believe that Christ is spiritually present within the elements, but we do believe, we must believe, uh, we actually contradict scripture if we fail to believe that Christ is with us as we are partaking of the Lord's table. In many churches that hold this view that the body and the, um, that the bread and the cup merely represent Christ, they take this view so far to say that Christ is nowhere near us when we are partaking of the Lord's table. And that is an incorrect interpretation of what the text is actually saying. Because Christ is always with us. He lives in us. He dwells within us. And so when we partake of the communion in a, in a symbolic way of his body and his blood, he is right there with us as we are partaking of the sacrifice that he gave for you and I. He is within us at our time of communion. And because Christ is within us at our time of communion, it should bring about a great deal of importance for us. It should be, be, be reminding us that we are not to go to this table lightly. We are not to view this table in sort of a nonchalant way as some sort of a tradition that we are keeping, but rather as Christ lives within us, when we approach that table, we are approaching it with Christ having welcomed us to the table to say, you, you have been set free by me, and this is symbolic of what I have done for you. We must hold this view very, very very strongly in our lives if we are to gain the spiritual benefits that do come from the fellowship table. Now, the second point in which I want us to see considering the expression of the Lord's table is a way in which it can become distorted. And the best example for us to see how the Lord's table can become distorted is shown in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 34. And now we're not going to read through all of that. Many of you are probably familiar with it. But I just want to summarize the error of the Corinthians uh, as they were participating in the Lord's table. You remember, as I told you just a little while ago, 
of the individuals, they would not merely uh, participate in the Lord's Supper like we do. We have it at the end of the service. We have the, uh, the cup and we have the bread. Uh, it's already separated. Uh, we're not having a meal before. It's just at the end of our service when we come to celebrate the Lord's table. But they didn't do it like that in the early church. They would have these fellowship meals or the love feasts as I have mentioned. And at these love feasts, they would have these, these dinners with one another. And then upon the dinner being completed, they would then participate in the Lord's table. That was the, always the way that they had done it. That's the way they were doing it in Acts. And that's the way they were doing it in 1 Corinthians. And, um, and it, wasn't only, it wasn't until later, uh, as we get to the book of Acts chapter 20, that they were doing it together at, um, at, on the Lord's Day, uh, celebrating the communion in the way in which that we ourselves celebrate it now. But you see, the way they were distorting this fellowship time was this. You have all of these people coming to the church, some that were wealthy, some that were poor, some that were kind of in the middle, and everyone would be bringing their food to the fellowship place where they were gathering in. But no one was sharing their food. No, the, 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 the wealthy people had, you know, they had the steak, the mashed potatoes, the green beans, the corn. That's not what they were eating, but that's what we would eat um, uh, on a good night out. You go to Applebee's or something, you get that nice big steak, and you get that uh, the, the juicy corn on the cob, and, and all of the, the good fixings that come with it. And, and it costs a good deal of money. Not everyone can afford that. And so they were bringing their good food, while their poor brothers were, were left to kind of scrape up the scraps, and they were just kind of left behind. Not only were they doing that, but they were also getting drunk. And so they were abandoning or disregarding their brothers and sisters in the Lord by them being full with their brothers being left hungry. But they were also drunk, which is a clear command from Scripture that we are to abstain from participating in. And so you say, where were they going wrong then when they entered the communion table? Well, you see, communion is not only a reflection of us remembering what Christ has done for us with his body that was broken and his blood that was shed but it also reminds us of the unity that we have with one another. The common ground that we share as brothers and sisters in the Lord becomes most visible when we share of that one bread and that one cup. And so Paul's saying to them, you want to go through this show and say, oh yeah, here's your bread. You know, we're going to share of Christ. Now here's your bread. Here's your bread. Everyone get their fill. We all want to be united with one another. When the reality was they cared nothing of them during those meals that they were partaking of. They were hypocrites. They were saying, well, yes, we love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. But yet they were leaving their brothers and sisters hungry. And so when Paul is, is chastising them, calling them out for it, he is saying, you say that you are approaching the Lord's table, but that is not the Lord's table, because the Lord's table is significant of the unity that you have with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. It is significant to showcase the oneness that you have with your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. They were completely distorting the Lord's table because because they were leaving behind their brothers and sisters in the Lord, and their fellowship ultimately was broken. And so these people, they were, they were hypocrites. They were not taking the supper in a worthy manner. And Paul warns them, and he says, those of you who are taking this supper in an unworthy manner, you may be wondering why you are sick or why you are dealing with diseases, and some of your other people have died. Well, the reason for this is because you're distorting the very, the very uh, ordinance that Christ brought about for his church to partake of. Communion was never meant for us to just kind of take it alone. Communion was always meant to be taken of within the body of Christ because it resembles or it pictures the unity that we have with one another. And so for these individuals to take the cupper, the, the cupper, the supper in an unworthy manner was by leaving their brothers behind and having no true fellowship with one another. And that's why we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Uh, to 30, when Paul says this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. See, we must understand that the Lord's table is not a joke. It is not merely this sort of uh, uh, willy-nilly thing that we partake of. It is a, a very, very important uh, participation of our lives that we must devote ourselves to doing it. We must view it 
rightly if we are able to gain the spiritual benefits that come from it. And this leads us to the final point, the purpose of the Lord's table. What is the purpose of the Lord's table? What results from the Lord's table when we come together and partake of it? Well, the first thing that results or that is the purpose of the Lord's table is that it causes for us to anticipate our Lord's return. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, Paul tells them, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Not only are we proclaiming the Lord's death and his blood that was shed for us on Calvary, but we are also proclaiming that he has not remained dead, but he is going to come again and bring us to himself. We are proclaiming, we are anticipating Jesus Christ's return when we come together to partake of the Lord's table. And that brings joy to us. You see, we deal with all different types of troubles in this life. Worries, fears, anxieties, persecutions, all of these things are are destined to come our way. They are inevitable. There's no way to escape them. But when we come to the Lord's table, we have that, that moment of joy and peace that has us anticipating the fact that one day Jesus is going to come and bring us to himself and we will never have any worries again. No longer will we fear. No longer will we deal with persecution persecution, but we will be in perfection with him for all of eternity. Secondly, the Lord's table celebrates the unity that we all have together as the body of Christ. And this is something that I have mentioned throughout our passage, but we see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. In fact, the song that we sung, Coco quoted this verse uh, with the song that we just sang uh, prior to coming up uh, to the sermon time. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 and 17 this, the cup of blessing that we bless Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Every time we come together and take of the Lord's table, we do so meeting on common ground. We may have our differences. We may have uh, more money, or one of us may have more money than the other person. One of us may have been a Christian longer. One of us uh, may be more mature in the faith in, in a simple sort of way. But when all of us come to the table of Jesus Christ, we meet on common ground. The common ground that all of us have. We are sinners who are in need of a Savior, and all of us unite hands recognizing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. One of the greatest ways to build unity within the life of a church is to continually devote yourself to the Lord's table because it is at the Lord's table that we all come together on common ground. No one, no one can say that they brought about their salvation. No one can say that by their individual efforts or works have become closer to Jesus Christ. It is only, only by Jesus Christ that we have been saved. And when we come together for the communion, we are uniting with each other, recognizing that Christ has set us free. The third way in which the purpose of the Lord's table comes about is shown to us in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. Paul says, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The, 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 the Lord's table is a purification method that God uses within the church. It is a purifying way in what, which God purges the church of sin and, and draws them back to himself to live in obedience with him. This is why Paul says we are to examine ourselves at the Lord's table. We are to see if we have any sin within us, any uh, disruptions or disunity with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And before we go forward to take that cup, we must, we must repent of our sins lest we eat of the cup and the bread in an unworthy manner and deal with the discipline of God as the result of it. And so God uses the Lord's table in a way in which to purge us from our sins and to purify us to a closer and more intimate relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ. You see, at the Lord's table, it is a time when relationships can be restored as we go to our brothers and sisters in the Lord and ask for their forgiveness. The Lord's table is a time when we can rededicate ourselves and our lives to Jesus Christ. The Lord's table is a time in which we can grow in our spiritual maturity. And then finally, and most importantly, the Lord's table reminds us of the eternal reality that we have that cannot change. That eternal reality that we Though we have sinned a great deal, a great amount, Christ's sacrifice paid for every single one of them. The Lord's table reminds us of the fact that we have been set free from our sins by the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that through him, we will live in the presence of God 
for all of eternity, with no more suffering, with no more weeping, with no more worries, with no more tears. We will be in complete and total perfection with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have as a purpose or as a, a result of our partaking of the Lord's table a reminder of the eternal, the eternal truth that cannot change. No matter what happens in our society, no matter how we might feel in our own strength, in our own selves, or in our own minds, there is an eternal reality that will not and cannot change. We are sinners who have been saved by Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are no longer sinners, but we are saints. An old hymn has these words. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? It is a hymn, but it is really a question It was written by Charles Wesley in the year, I think, 1737. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? We come to the table reflecting upon that very truth, that God himself took on flesh, recognizing that we ourselves could not, we could not save ourselves. We should be under the wrath of God for all of eternity. We deserve the eternal punishment that many are going to go to on that final day of judgment. But God, in his grace and his mercy, has saved us. You say, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? It is totally grace. It is the mercy of God in our lives. It is God who is an eternal God who loved us enough to send his son to die on the cross for our sins. And, and as he's, his son was dying on the cross for our sins and his blood was being poured out, God poured out his wrath that should have been our wrath on his son, Jesus Christ. The communion table reminds us of the love of God and the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, church, though trials might come our way, though persecution through our family members or our friends or our bosses, whatever the case, however they might come, as we share the gospel, as we live our lives in in, in holiness following Jesus Christ, we have this eternal reminder that we have at the Lord's table when we come together. We come to the table remembering that, that we have salvation from sins. We come to the table remembering that Christ paid it all. We come together to the table knowing that though we may feel alone in the world, we have our brothers and sisters in the Lord who are with us always, who are there to help us and to comfort us in our difficulties and our trials. And then finally, finally we have the opportunity to rejoice in the fact that all of these worries that we have, our Lord has overcome them. Our Lord has overcome all of our trials, all of our worries. He has overcome all of our thoughts, all of our difficulties, all of our sins, and we are reminded of that continuously as we come to the table of our Lord. And so I ask you, do you wish to come to the table? Do you wish, do you desire what the church to, has done from all the be- from the beginning of its inception to do? Do you desire to come to the table of the Lord and to feast upon the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you desire to do this? Are you willing to devote yourself to the table of the Lord? And not only just devote yourself to it, but as you are, are, are participating it, in it, are you, are you examining yourselves? Are you calling out the sin in your life by the conviction of the Holy Spirit and saying, I need to rid myself of this very thing if I am going to approach that table? Are you using it as God has intended it for, it for it to be used to purify yourself from sins? As you approach the table, are you reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross and that the elements that you are partaking of, though they signify what he has done, these elements came about at an extremely high price, namely Christ's death and blood being poured out for you and I, though he was perfect and did not need to do what he has done. As you continue to come to the Lord's table, as you continue to draw near to Christ and, and, and your brothers and sisters in the Lord uh, at the Lord's table, are you willing to devote yourselves to it? Church, as we close our uh, service out today, Coco and Didi are going to be singing a song, and she picked it. It's, it's, as the Spirit is, is, has united us, she picked the song, Come to the Table. And I know we just took communion last week, but I want to make an opportunity available to anyone here today, anyone who wishes to come and take communion. uh, Over by Trevor, we have the the table set up. As Coco and Didi sing, if if you feel so led to to, to live out what you have just learned of today in the scriptures, if you feel led to go to that table where where Christ calls on you to remember his sacrifice,
his, his death on the cross and his blood that was shed. I encourage you to take of the elements. And as Coco and Didi are singing, I, I encourage you to, uh, to pray, to examine yourselves, and then take of the cup and take of the bread. Now do that. Do that. If you want someone to join you in doing that, uh, call me over. Or call someone, one of your friends over to come and, and take of the Lord's table with you. I want us to, to grow in unity with one another as we take of the Lord's table now. And I know we have the COVID restrictions and all of those things, but, but remember that this time that we have together is a time of fellowship with one another. It is an opportunity for us to be united to one another through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so would you come to the table now? As Coco and Didi lead us.